Let's open in a word of prayer and we'll get started. Lord, thank you for the opportunity we have to meet together. We thank you for the opportunity to to look into your word. We thank you that it's been preserved for us without error. We pray that you would give us understanding. And we thank you for Jesus Christ's death on the cross for our sins. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. The subject that we're going to take up this morning is how to know the will of God. This is a subject that people are very concerned with. They, they ask themselves questions about this all the time. And the, just to give you an example, the way that this topic typically plays out is people think, I want to know God's will for my life. What, what does He want me to do? Does He want me to, to marry this person or, or, or that person? Does He want me to pursue this career? Does he want me to live in this place or that place? Or sometimes what happens is there's a decision in front of someone that they have to make. And so they think about it from the standpoint of (coughs) which one is God's will for my life? Is it to do option A or is it to do option B? And so what we want to do this morning (coughs) is we want to understand from the scriptures, how to think about the issue of the will of God in the believer's life. So let's jump in. If you look at the phrase, will of God, so in other words, W-I-L-L, of God, that quote. If you look at that phrase, it appears 23 times in scripture. 15 of those are in Paul's epistles, Six are in the Hebrew epistles, one is in the Gospels, and one is in Acts. Where we're going to start is we're going to look at things that are explicitly stated to be the will of God in Paul's epistles. So we're going to start with Paul's epistles, and we're going to look at things where it specifically says that it is the will of God. And I'm going to break those, if you will, into three categories. So the first category is things that God did or does. So get with me, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. <clears throat> so we're looking at the phrase, the will of God. We're focusing on Paul's epistles. And so we're going to be looking at things that the Bible specifically says are the will of God. And the first section we're going to look at is things that God does or that God did. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother. Get with me 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. Now, we won't turn there, but Ephesians 1.1, Colossians 1.1, and 2 Timothy 1.1 all begin in that similar way. Now, think about that just for a minute. How many times does the phrase, the will of God, occur in scriptures? 23. I was actually testing if you were paying attention a minute ago. So it only appears 23 times in Scripture, and yet five of those are devoted to the fact that the apostleship of Paul is according to the will of God. Isn't that fascinating? Now, the reason I mention that is that one of the things that you're going to hear, if you rightly divide the Scriptures, is people are going to say to you, you worship Paul, you make too much of Paul. And they'll say, we don't follow Paul, we follow Jesus. And all of that is a bunch of hooey. Here's why. If you're in the Old Testament, if you're part of Old Testament Israel, and Moses gives an instruction, should your response be, well, we're not following Moses, we follow Jehovah. What's wrong with that, with that type of thinking? 
God told Moses what he wanted revealed to Israel. So when someone says, well, we don't follow Moses, you are rejecting God's spokesman, right? During the dispensation of grace, when you do not respect Paul's apostleship, it's not that you're hurting Paul's feelings. What are you doing? You're disobeying the Lord Jesus Christ, who on the road to Damascus appeared to Saul and gave him the apostleship that he subsequently had. Paul's 13 epistles, the human author is Paul, but who's the real author? The Holy Spirit. So when you ignore those epistles, who are you ignoring? You're ignoring the Holy Spirit is what you're doing. Now you know this, but in 1 Corinthians 14 verse 37, Paul says, if any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things I write are the suggestions of the Lord. <laughs> the commandments of the Lord. So when you disobey Pauline authority, who are you disobeying? You're disobeying God. You see that. So the first thing we'll just notice is this. Five different times when Scripture talks about the will of God, it is mentioning Paul's apostleship. So one more thing on that, we'll move on. When you think about the timeline of history, it's very obvious that in the middle of the book of Acts, God starts to do something different from what he did previously. Paul has a ministry directly to Gentiles that did not exist in time past. And the reason why is that God made a decision to interrupt the prophetic calendar and insert the dispensation of grace, which is a time of amnesty for the entire world. If you are going to understand what God is doing today and the purpose for your life today, you have to understand the revelation that was given for today. Right? There's no way around that. Get with me Galatians chapter 1, verse 4. So the first thing that God did was, that is the will of God, is he gave Paul a particular apostleship. God feels that's so important, he mentioned it five different times. I'll say one more thing as you're turning to Galatians 1. In Mark chapter 9, verses 44, 46, 48. The scripture says, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. The Lord says that three times. Modern versions don't like the fact that the Lord said that three times. And so what modern versions will often do is either omit verses 46 and 48 or they'll put in a textual note to suggest that essentially it's a copyist error. In other words, someone was copying it and they got confused and they wrote it again when they really shouldn't have because it was in verse 44. So you don't need it in verse 46 and you don't need it in verse 48. Now what's the problem with that? Have you ever in your life been explaining something and the topic was so important that you repeated yourself? So like, I'll give you a for instance. When you tell your children not to play in the street, you may say that more than once because it's sufficiently important that you realize, by the way, when you talk to people, don't they ignore about half of what you say? So what happens is sometimes you repeat and you say it again because knowing how human nature is, emphasis and repetition secures people's attention and they grasp what you're saying. In Mark 9, when the Lord says, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched, he wasn't stuttering. He was repeating for emphasis, right? In other words, what he was saying is, the lake of fire is so horrifically bad I'm going to repeat myself and then repeat myself. In other words, where the worm dieth not, what he's saying is the state of the lost man in the next life most closely resembles what? A worm. 
That mere fact should grab your attention. And the worm does what? It dieth not. One of the realities of earthly life, and I'm just being candid with you, <clears throat> there's a limit to how much torture the body can endure. Right? Because you just die. And death is a release from that torture. But if you're being tortured, and then you die, and you're unsaved, what happens? Well, now you're in a situation where the worm dieth not. In other words, you're going to have that torment for how long? For all eternity. And it says, where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not what? Quenched. Don't people say things like, well, the flames of hell are not literal. It's symbolic. It's figurative. Okay, let's even, let's assume that's true, which I don't agree, but let's assume that's true. If it's figurative, it's figurative for something that is like that. Right? The reason why the Lord says it three times, you get this, is it's so important, it's so critical, he repeats himself because what he's saying is, don't miss this, right? Well, if the Lord repeats himself three times about the, 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 the torment, the agony of hell, and he repeats himself five times as to Paul's apostleship, <coughs> excuse me, is Paul's apostleship a matter of great importance to God himself? It is. Galatians 1, 4. <clears throat> Who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. What Galatians 1, 4 says is that it was God's will that Jesus Christ give himself for our sins. In other words, that was part of God's plan. God had purposed it. He had worked all of it out. That was something that was done according to the will of God. Get Romans 8, verse 27. Romans chapter 8, in verse 27. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Now we read verse 27, but let's read verse 26 so we get the context here. Likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. What Romans 8.26 is saying is that the Holy Spirit intercedes on behalf of the believer. Who does the Holy Spirit intercede with? God the Father, right? Romans 8.26 says, we know not what we should pray for as we ought. Do we have limitations in our prayer life? And the answer is yes, we do. So Romans 8.26, the Holy Spirit intercedes on our behalf. Now notice what verse 27 says. And, <clears throat> this is something additional, and he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit. So this is someone other than the Spirit. Because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And here's what I want you to grasp. This is just absolutely fascinating. In verse 26, the Holy Spirit intercedes on the believer's behalf with God the Father. Who intercedes on the believer's behalf in verse 27? He that searcheth the hearts, which I would tell you when you run the cross-references, that's Jesus Christ. So ponder this. You're familiar with Romans 8 where it says, If God be for us, who can be against us? In Romans 8.26, the Holy Spirit intercedes on behalf of the believer with God the Father. In Romans 8, 27, Jesus Christ intercedes on behalf of the believer with God the Father. You have two people of the Godhead interceding on your behalf with God the Father. Isn't that 
absolutely profound. I mean, what, what, what a position you have in Jesus Christ. Now, Romans 8.27 <clears throat> says that that's done according to the will of God. God desires it to be that way. That's His purpose. <clears throat> Look with me at Philippians 2, verse 13. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 13. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. It's God's desire to work in the believer. Let me make this observation. God's first desire for everyone's life is that they be saved. God doesn't want anyone to go to the lake of fire. He wants them to trust the blood payment that Jesus Christ made on our behalf. But once that's done, that occurs in a moment of time. What does God then want to do? God desires to work in the believer. Think of it this way. <clears throat> The way that sometimes people think about things is, well, I need to believe the gospel, and that'll make me saved, and that way I don't go to the lake of fire, and that's all good. And then once I've got that resolved, then good, now I'll do what I want. And a lot of people think about things that way. But God's purpose for your life is not to save you so that you can do what you want. You are already doing a fine job of that. It's to save you so that he can now work his will through you. And, and, and by the way, that's the most glorious life there is. What, what happens when you live to yourself? It is utterly empty. And you know that because you did that for a while, <laughs> right? So God's will is, is to work in us <clears throat> to, to redeem not just our souls, but our, but our life, that it would be used for his glory. Give me 1 Timothy chapter 2. So the first category we looked at is, is things that God did or does that are part of His will. What I now want to show you is I want to show you some things that men need to do. In other words, these are things that we need to understand and apply about God's will. 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Now, what does 1 Timothy 2, verses 3 and 4 do to Calvinism? Calvinism is the idea God picks person A, but not person B, person C, but not person D, because God has chosen the elect to be saved. And if you're not one of the elect, then too bad, so sad. Is that what 1 Timothy 2, verses 3 and 4 says? How many people does God desire to save? Who will have all men to be saved? Meaning, if you want to be in God's will, what's the first thing you need to do? Get saved, right? If you're not saved, you're not in God's will. Now, notice the second part of verse 4 who will have all men to be saved, and what? To come unto the knowledge of the truth. What is the largest denomination mentioned in the Scriptures? The ignorant brethren, the ignorant brethren right? <clears throat> you're saved in a moment when you believe the gospel, but the moment you're saved, how much doctrine do you know? None. None. Because 1 Corinthians 2 tells you that spiritual things are revealed by the Spirit, so how much spiritual knowledge does a lost man have? None. So the moment you get saved, you basically know the gospel and that's it. You don't know anything else. So what is God's desire for your life? Is it for you to remain in a state of blissful ignorance? No. It's to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Now keep 1 Timothy 2, get Romans 16.25. Now you can decide if this is a good cross-reference or not. I think it is, but you should 
study it for yourself. Look at Romans 16, 25. Now to him that is of power. So God has the power to do something. Now to him that is of power to establish you, to establish, to make stable. Well, how does God do that? According to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Now what I'm going to suggest to you is this. When 1 Timothy 2 verses 3 and 4 mentioned two aspects of God's will. The first one was that all men be saved, and then the second one was that they come unto the knowledge of the truth. I'm going to suggest to you that that framework lines up exactly with Romans 16, 25, and 26. How does God establish people? My gospel. What saves someone today? My gospel. That's how all men be saved. And then what's coming under the knowledge of the truth? It's the preaching of Jesus Christ. But how? According to the revelation of the mystery. Now here's why that matters. Someone has told you at one point or another that a red letter Bible is a good thing. Because what do the red letters show? That's what Jesus said. It's kind of like when you go into a restaurant and they have some items that are red. Those are the things Jesus would order. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> but in all seriousness, what you've been told with red letter Bibles is the red letter Bibles are helpful because they put the words of the Lord in red and therefore your eye will be drawn to the most important things. That's just silly. How much of the Word of God is inspired by the Holy Spirit? All of it. All of it. Now, let me just ask you a practical question. Which is more important to your daily life today? Understanding the sacrificial offerings of Leviticus or Paul's writings? Everything is true. All of it is true. No question about it. But do I need to apply the sacrificial offerings of Leviticus to my life today? I don't. Meaning, as I study and I focus on things, I'm going to start with Paul's epistles. I need to know the whole counsel of God. I need to know all of it. But as a practical matter, where should I start? I should start with that which is written to me today. Isn't that obvious? That's more than obvious. What do the red letter Bibles do? The red letter Bibles draw one's attention to the Lord's earthly ministry, and the Lord's earthly ministry is not the same as what God is doing during the dispensation of grace. It's just not. That's why Romans 16.25 is so important. It says the preaching of Jesus Christ according to what? According to the earthly ministry according to the gospel of the kingdom, according to the prophetic program. It says none of that. It says the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Let me say this then. If your approach to study is to make Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the red letters, the things spoken during the Lord's earthly ministry, the focus of your spiritual attention, you are not going to be established, made stable, on the authority of Romans 16, 25. You see that? Paul specifically warns in Ephesians 4, he talks about those that are tossed to and fro. They're carried about by every wind of doctrine. And what he's using there is he's using a nautical series of metaphors. The toss to and fro is like a ship at sea, right? And then it talks about carried about with every what? Wind of doctrine. So this is a tough question, but I want you to think about it. How many motorboats were there in Paul's day? None. So how did ships move? By the wind. By the wind. And so if you're not established, rooted, grounded, 
What are you going to be carried about by? Every wind of doctrine. And what happens with the vast majority of, the, of believers is they're never established, they're never rooted, they're never grounded. All of those are land terms, aren't they? Because they're tossed to and fro because they're, they're adrift at sea. And doesn't, in fact, Paul talk about being shipwrecked? Doesn't he talk about those that are cast away? That, that, that is the result of the failure to be established by my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to what? The revelation of the mystery. It's absolutely essential. It's not optional. Look at me at Romans 12, verse 2. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. Romans 12, 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What the Lord is saying there is that we shouldn't be conformed to the world, we should be transformed, but how do we do that? According to that verse, it's by the renewing of our mind. Where does your mind get renewed? By the Scriptures. And then it says that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Based upon that verse, do you know the will of God by emotion, circumstance, inner peace, or do you know it as the result of study? Now, you've seen this before, but I'll just do this for you. So the guy gets up in the morning and he says, God, I really want to know your will. Show me what you would have me do. So he closed his eyes. Then Judas went and hung himself. And he says, Lord, 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 I've, I'm serious. I, I want to know your will. Show me what you would have me to do. Go thou and do likewise. God, no, I, I, I want to know your will. Please reveal it to me. Show me what you would have me to do. What thou do, doest quickly. Now, what's the point of that? It's mindless superstition, isn't it? Can you just randomly put down your finger and say, well, this is the verse for me? God wants you to think, right? Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. <clears throat> Doesn't 1 Corinthians 2.13 talk about comparing spiritual things with spiritual? Does, why were the Bereans commended in Acts 17? Because what they did is they point their fingers in a verse daily, whether those things were so. It said search, didn't it? They searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Did it require work? 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a senior executive that needeth not to be ashamed, a manager, a leader. Now, here's the way life works, right? You know this. There's people who oversee things and people who do actual work, right? Maybe this is news to some of you, I don't know. What does 2 Timothy 2.15 say? A workman. What is the fundamental characteristic of a workman? They work! Right? So when it says, study to show thyself approved unto God, it's talking about effort there. Doesn't Paul talk about laboring in prayers? In other words, your spiritual life is not cruise control, there's effort involved. Get with me Colossians 4.12. What I'm suggesting to you is you know the will of God not by intuition, but by study. Colossians 4, verse 12. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that ye may stand perfect and complete 
in all the will of God. And the, des the desire there is the believer would be perfect, he'd be complete, he'd be mature, and notice, in all the will of God. Well, that requires understanding. Give with me 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. God's will for your life is your sanctification. Now get with me Titus chapter 2. When you teach grace, people will say to you, well, you think you can live any old way you want. You can say a prayer and believe the gospel, and then you can live like the devil. And they think that what grace means is, grace means it doesn't matter how you live. Now, to be clear, it doesn't matter how you live at all with regard to salvation. You're saved by grace alone through faith alone, and it has nothing to do with works. But does grace then teach you, you're saved, go ahead and be a jerk? Look at me at Titus 2. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that we should do whatever we want, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. So does grace teach you to live like an idiot? Listen, you don't need any teaching to live like an idiot. You're perfectly capable. In fact, you're skilled, talented, and experienced. Isn't that the truth? Grace teaches you to live like Titus 2.12 says. Get 1 Thessalonians 5.18. First Thessalonians 5:18 In everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. I'll make this observation you can decide if it's true or not. Oftentimes our prayer life is this. God, I got this problem I want you to fix it. I got a different problem I want you to fix that. I got another problem I want you to fix this. And it's, and it's okay to pray about those things, but that's kind of what our prayer life often is. Well, how does Scripture tell you to think about the circumstances of your life? In everything, every situation, every circumstance, what are we supposed to do? Give thanks, for that's the will of God for our lives. Part of that that I'll say is this. Whatever thing you're going through, however bad it is, one of the realities for the believer is this. If I believe the gospel, my identity is now in Christ. I'm complete in Him, according to Colossians 2.10. I'm accepted in the beloved, according to Ephesians 1. So if I have, you know, whatever it is, a health problem or a work problem or a financial problem or, you know, whatever, all the problems of life, those aren't fun. We wish we didn't have them. But do any of them in any way impact who I am or my future destiny? And they don't. They don't, right? No matter what you're going through in life, it, as a saved person, it can't affect the fact that you're going to be in heavenly places for all eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ. So anything before then is a speed bump. It's an inconvenience. Some of them are, you know, difficult, not, not necessarily easy. But should we give thanks in every situation? The answer to that is yes. And that's God's will for our lives. Give with me 2 Corinthians 8, verse 5. Second Corinthians chapter 8, verse 5, And this they did, 
not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. And Paul's talking there about the saints giving themselves unto the apostles by the will of God. Give me Ephesians 6, verse 6. <clears throat> Ephesians 6, 6. <clears throat> and we'll start in verse 5, Ephesians 6, 5. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in singleness of your heart as unto Christ not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, <coughs> doing the will of God from the heart. <coughs> so let's talk about that. That's a very practical verse. When it talks there about eye service, what does that mean? When the cat's away, the mice will play, right? <coughs> Let me ask you this question. <coughs> if you've ever been in any workplace... Does more work get done when the boss is present and visually watching things or when he's away? And you know the answer to that. And the reason why it's that way is it's eye service. When the boss is there and watching, look busy, get things done, make it happen. But when the boss isn't there, eh, take it easy. By the way, What's the most common pastime in the workplace? Complaining about how bad the boss is. Right? That's life. I mean, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, am I? How are you supposed to think about that? Scripturally. Scripturally. It says, with fear and trembling, in singleness of your heart as unto Christ. See, God's will for our lives is that we serve our masters, our bosses, as we would Christ. That's his desire for us. Uh, so those all things are the will of God. So that section there that we just completed, those are all things that men need to do. As a believer, those are things you should make real in your life. Let's look at one more. Get Romans chapter 1, verse 10. And what we're looking at next is what I'm going to call God's situational will. The first thing we looked at was things that God did or does. Then we looked at things that men need to do as to be in the will of God. This is what I'm going to call God's situational will. Romans 1, verse 10. Making request, if by any means now at length, I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. So Paul's praying about his upcoming journey, and he hopes that by the will of God, he might have a prosperous journey to come unto them. Let me ask you this. Is a prosperous journey in that verse guaranteed? It's not. Paul hopes that he'll have one, but it's not, it's not guaranteed. It's not a sure thing. Look at me at Romans 15, verse 32. Romans chapter 15, verse 32. That I may come unto you with joy by the will of God and may with you be re refreshed. Paul's hoping that his journey unto them goes well, but it's not guaranteed. Look at me at 1 Corinthians 16, verse 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 7. For I will not see you now by the way, but I trust to tarry a while with you. Now notice what it says. If the Lord permit. Now that's written by the Holy Spirit, isn't it? Yes. Did, did Paul have certainty that, was, that God was going to allow that? He didn't. 
what he's saying there is that <clears throat> he hopes to tarry with them for a while, but it's going to depend on whether God permits it or not. In other words, he didn't know. So what I'm going to suggest to you with all the stuff we've looked at, I'm going to suggest to you that the will of God fits into the following two categories. The first is the revealed. In other words, the written will of God. In other words, it's things explicitly stated to be the will of God in the Scriptures. For example, uh, give thanks in all things, for this is the will of God. Is it, it, it's very clear that it is God's revealed will that you give thanks in all things. Now, just for the sake of completeness, understand that even if Scripture doesn't use the phrase, the will of God, but God commands you to do it, it, it is His will. So I'll give you an example. When, when Paul says in 2 Timothy 4, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, is it God's will that we preach the word? It is because it's a command, right? Preach the word. It's an instruction. In 1 Thessalonians 5, when it says, rejoice evermore, is that a command? It is. So is it God's will for our lives that we rejoice evermore? It is, because He commanded us to do so. So the first type of the will of God is the revealed, the written will of God. Here's the second. The unrevealed or the unwritten will of God. And what is that? The unrevealed will of God is God's will in any particular event or circumstance of life. During the dispensation of grace, it is not possible to know the unrevealed, the situational will of God, even after the fact. Now, why do I say that? Give me, give me Philemon in verse 15. <clears throat> so, the book of Philemon, and we're going to look at verse 15. Now, before we look at this verse, I want to just remind you of one or two things. The book of Philemon is a book that Paul writes to Philemon. And Philemon had a servant named Onesimus. And what happens is Onesimus runs away from Philemon. And when he does that, as he's running away, he bumps into the Apostle Paul and he gets saved. Paul desires that Onesimus would stay with Paul and help with the ministry. But what Paul decides to do is because he wants to respect Philemon's authority, Philemon's right to make a decision about that, Paul writes the epistle to Philemon, gives it to Onesimus, and says, Onesimus, what I want you to do is I want you to go back to Philemon, and I want you to give him this letter, and let him decide if he will allow you to travel with me and do the work of the ministry. Now, with that as context, read verse 15. For perhaps he therefore departed for a season, that thou shouldest receive him forever. What, what Paul's saying there in verse 15 is, Onesimus departed from you, perhaps that thou shouldest receive him forever as a brother. In other words, think about this for a minute. When you look at these events where Onesimus leaves Philemon and travels, and he bumps into the apostle of Gentiles, learns the gospel and gets saved, doesn't that look like God's working? I mean, God desires all men to be saved. We already looked at that, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. So it looks like that's God's hand. Paul doesn't say that in verse 15. What word does he use? Perhaps. 
So when you look at the events of life, I'll give you an example. You know what people do all the time? When something bad happens, the devil did it. And when something good happens, God did it. And so what people do is they look at their lives, and if they like the event, then that's attributable to God. And if they don't, then it was the devil. Scripture doesn't do things that way. Paul, writing by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in describing these events, uses the word perhaps. So I, I want you to look at a handout with me. So I'm going to project this. All right. So this is differences between the revealed and the unrevealed will of God. So let's do the revealed will of God first. The revealed will of God is things explicitly stated to be the will of God in the Scripture. We looked at several of those. In other words, if God says something is His will, then it's obviously His will. There are things that are not explicitly stated to be the will of God because it doesn't use the phrase the will of God, but if it's a command, it's obviously God's will. So an example here. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Is you giving thanks in every situation God's will? Yes. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says that. Another example, 1 Timothy 2, verses 3 and 4. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. Philippians 4.4. 4. Now notice this here. It doesn't use the phrase the will of God, but it says rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Is it God's will for your life that you rejoice? It, it is because you're commanded to do that. You see all that. So that's why I call that the revealed will of God, because God revealed to, to us in His Word that He would have us do those things. So is the revealed will of God revealed in Scripture? Yes, it's in writing. Did God intend for it to be known? Yes, because He told us. He, he recorded it. Do we have the ability to know it? Yes, it can be proven and known in advance. So do you know right now that you should rejoice evermore for the rest of your life? Yes, you can know that. Now look at this next one. Does it vary by circumstance? In everything, give thanks. So should you give thanks irrespective of the circumstance? Yes. For this is the will of God that all men be saved. Does God have a different will for different folks about being saved? Does God have a different will for different folks about coming under the knowledge of the truth? He doesn't. So the revealed will of God doesn't vary by circumstance. Let me... I'll, be, I'll say one more thing about it in a minute. Is it relevant to decision making? It is. Because you should make choices in your life to fulfill the revealed will of God. You should go by what God has told you to do. To do. Now this last part here is the percent of will of God versus 19 of 23, 80% of them are the revealed will of God. Now let's look at the unrevealed will of God. When you think of the unrevealed will of God, think about it this way. You know where we started today? I've got a decision coming up in life. Should I go to this school? Should I go to that school? Should I buy this car or that car? Should I take this job or that job? When people talk about the will of God, what they frequently mean is, I have a decision to make, and I want to know this or that. Which one do I do? Well, the unrevealed will of God is God's will as to what happens with regard to a particular event or circumstance in life and which is not contained in the Scriptures. So there's no place in the Scriptures that says, Tim should buy this car or Jim should take this job. There's no verse that says that. So let's look at examples of this. Romans 1 verse 10 making request if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. That's 
situational, that's unrevealed. What Paul's talking about in Romans 1 is he's talking about a very specific journey that he's going to make, and he's hoping that it's a profitable one, but you notice that he uses the word might. Look at Romans 15, verse 30. Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit, that ye strive together with me in your prayers to God for me, that I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea. Now let me pause there. Were there times in Paul's life where he wasn't delivered from the bad guys? There were. So he might pray about it. He might want it to happen. But is it a guarantee? It's not a guarantee. That I may delivered may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea, and that my service which I have for Jerusalem may be accepted of the saints, that I may come unto you with joy by the will of God, and may with you be refreshed. Paul's hopeful, but it's not guaranteed. 1 Peter 3, 17, For it is better if the will of God be so. Doesn't that sound exactly like perhaps? Maybe this will be God's will, maybe it won't in this particular situation. For it is better if the will of God be so that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 7, For I will not see you now by the way, but I trust to tarry a while with you, if the Lord permit. Let me pause there for a minute. What is commonplace for people today to do is to speak presumptuously. God did this in this situation. God opened this door. He did this, that, and the other. Do you really know? Do you really know? Because when Paul, speaking by the Holy Spirit here, he doesn't know, right? When he says, if the Lord permit, he's saying, I don't know. Maybe he will, maybe he won't, but I don't know. So look at the next row. <clears throat> With regard to the unrevealed or the situational will of God, is it revealed in Scripture? And the answer is no. There's not a verse on that. Well, if God didn't reveal it, did God intend for it to be known? He didn't because that's why he didn't reveal it. Ability to know. The unrevealed will of God is impossible to prove and know in advance, cannot necessarily be known even after the fact, and we have Philippian, Philemon 1.15 there. Even after the fact, Paul didn't say that it was God's will what happened with Onesimus. Now notice this next. Varies by circumstance. Yes. Now I'm going to say this and you decide for yourself. When people think about the will of God and they say, I want to be right in the center of the will of God, and they're thinking about decision A or decision B, buy this or that, go this place or that, do this or that. It varies by circumstance, and you can't know it. But let me give you a contrast. Doesn't matter how old you are or how young you are. Doesn't matter your health condition. Doesn't matter your income. Doesn't matter your education. The revealed will of God, God wants you to be saved. He wants you to come under the knowledge of the truth. He wants you to be sanctified. He wants you to prove and know His will. He wants you to give thanks in all circumstances. Every single one of the revealed will of God, should you do that at every moment in your life? You should. And so what I am convinced, you can decide for yourself, what man does is God has his revealed will where he tells you a whole bunch of things that you absolutely should do because every human being should do it irrespective of circumstance. And instead of focusing on the revealed will of God, which can be known and applies to our lives, we want to know about the unrevealed. What do I do in this particular situation? Do you see how our focus is wrong? <clears throat> now look at this next part. Relevant to decision-making, 
The unrevealed will of God is not relevant to, to decision making because you don't necessarily know what God will do and you can't make decisions on that basis. Now, <clears throat> here's an example here from Daniel 3. Do you remember when the children, the Hebrew children are going to be cast into the fire? Now notice this. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. What are they saying? Do they know for sure what's going to happen? They don't. So they're not taking what's going to happen into their knowledge. What they're deciding is we're not going to serve your golden idol. We're not going to worship your golden image. And what they're acknowledging there is they don't know what God will do. It's the same thing as if the Lord permit, or perhaps. So let me suggest this. When you think about the issues of the will of God, man tends to focus on the situational and the unrevealed which he can't know, rather than the revealed, which he can know and should know. Okay? One more thing. One more thing. Have you ever heard someone say, I prayed about this decision and I had peace, so I knew it was the right thing to do? Get with me, Jonah, Chapter 1. Get Jonah chapter 1. We'll look at verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Now, is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's a bad thing because he's fleeing from the Lord's presence. And went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down in it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. In other words, what literally happens is God tells Jonah to go to Nineveh, and Jonah doesn't say, no. He doesn't say, I'll think about it. He doesn't sit there. What he does is he gets in a ship to go the exact opposite direction. In other words, he tries to put himself as far away from what God told him to do. Now notice this. Verse 4, But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea. And there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid. So how bad is this storm? It's pretty bad if the mariners themselves are afraid, because of course they've seen some things. Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. So they're literally throwing away the cargo of the ship. That's how bad it is. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. Jonah apparently had peace in the midst of the storm, didn't he? He did. So does peace and an emotional sense of comfort guarantee that the decision is right? I would tell you that it doesn't. <clears throat> Get with me Jeremiah 17, verse 9. <clears throat> what some folks will say is, I was thinking about this decision, and God spoke to me, and he told me what I should do. Now, you can decide for yourself. I'm going to give you my view on this. When people say 
that God spoke to them, what they often will say is, well, it wasn't in an audible voice because they don't want you to think they're hearing voices. But God spoke to me and he told me such and such. Does every voice that goes through your head, is that the Holy Spirit? Or let me put it this way. Are there some voices that go through your head that definitely are not the Holy Spirit? There are, aren't there? Look with me at Jeremiah 17, verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. Now some will say that verse doesn't apply to saved people. And my question on that would be, if you don't think that verse applies to you, then write down all your thoughts for the next week, stand up, and read them to the group. And no one will do that. Why will no one do that? Because you know good and well that not every thought you have is a thought that is holy or a thought that is from the Holy Spirit. You understand that, right? One more thing on that. When people say, God spoke to me, here's the most common example. God spoke to me, and he told me, we need to build this new building, and we don't have money for it, but we're stepping out in faith because God told me to do that. So God told you, to do that, even though you don't really have finances or a plan for it to be reality. Is, does that seem consistent with Proverbs? Now, related to that, I'll just say this. When people say, God spoke to me, and he told me to do this, if God was actually speaking to people today, you know what he would say to them? He would, he would say everything that is the revealed will of God. That was his purpose, right? In other words, the reason why God created the scriptures, inspired them, and preserved them is so that you would know what God wants you to do. What is absolutely amazing is all the people that God supposedly speaks to, he never tells any of them to be a mid ax dispensationalist. He never tells any of them to read the King James Bible. He never tells any of them to rightly divide. Why doesn't he do that? Because that's what this book does. So what does that tell you about the voices people are hearing? They're not all from God. The reality is a lot of them, it's just thoughts that go through your mind, right? That's what it is. So let me bring this to conclusion. The issue of how to know the will of God for your life. Knowing the will of God for your life is not the voices that go through your mind. It's not the situations. You know, what will happen is a hurricane will hit a place and people say, what's God trying to tell us? What God's trying to tell you, he has told you. He's not trying to tell you things through weather. He tells you things through his written word that he has preserved. So the, the short answer of how to know the will of God is to get into this book and to understand what God's will for your life is. Amen? Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you've preserved it for us. We thank you, Lord, that we don't have to go by something as unreliable as our own opinions and thoughts, but we can search your word and we can learn your will for our lives. We pray, Lord, that we would grow in understanding and grace. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.